Still at the 10, still here, that's all me. Black, black love, 2 G. Dance. Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. Uh, I'm about to be joined by Stephanie Ali from the New Georgia Project. If you are in this room because you want to know about reproductive justice and voting, you're in the right place. Uh, so let me briefly introduce our speaker. Stephanie Jackson Ali is the policy director with New Georgia Project, where she oversees a team working to educate and engage our communities around issues at the federal, state, and local levels that affect their lives. She also oversees political education work designed to create a better informed community. Stephanie has worked in progressive politics in Georgia since 2010, holding jobs advocating for reproductive justice, consumer safety reform, immigrant justice, HIV medication access, and most consistently, voting rights and voter access. Stephanie is also a triple dog with undergraduate degrees in English and journalism and a master's of social work in community empowerment and program development. When she is not working, Stephanie is dedicated to her son, her husband, her dogs, and her comic books. So welcome, Stephanie, from the New Georgia Project. Please take it away. Hey, everyone. And um, excited to be here to talk to everyone today. I like a conversation. So I'm going to, you know, you'll see my slides are kind of bare bones because I prefer us to be able to talk. So we are going to, we have a lovely person assisting us, Grace, who's going to just help us to <coughs> let people ask questions. So we'll be doing that. And then I'm going to go ahead and just say it. You're going to hear sounds in the background all day, which is my toddler running around. This is also why I am here with wet hair. So toddler mom life for anyone who gets that. So I'm going to share screens so that you can kind of see my very basic PowerPoint. It's going to be 30 seconds. And we'll put this in presentation mode in just a sec when it stops freezing on me. So, hello. Very excited to be here with y'all. And again, that's me. I'm Stephanie Ali. Rula told you a little bit about me. Um, I think the way I come to the RJ space is someone who has kind of heard about it my whole life in, in the sense that the first time I ever heard about abortion, about reproductive justice, about reproductive health. I was I was 10 years old. I'm from Birmingham. And um, if you know one thing about Birmingham and abortion access, it's that our clinic was bombed in 1998. And I was 10 years old. And that's the first time I'd ever heard such a word. And it automatically connected this idea that people can die because of seeking this care. It's that intense of a debate for people. Um, and and throughout my professional career, you know, as I grew up, as I was a rebellious teenager, as I led college clubs and then became a professional advocate, it was just abundantly clear that this is where the world is taking us to taking away our bodily autonomy by whatever means is necessary. And so uh, when 481 came through, HB 481, which is our anti-choice bill here in Georgia in 2019, I was pregnant with my son. I found out literally the day before one of the big debates. So I'm like brush off of finding out, deciding, you know, what is going to happen with my life. And the next day having to go into work hearing all of these men talk about taking away choice from women and then these fantastic advocates stepping up to talk about maternal mortality and all the things that could go wrong and affordability for parenthood and so it sits personally whether you have sought an abortion whether you have not whether you have gone through motherhood or parenthood in any way whether you have not and just being at those kind of two bookends of before I started my career and really at, as my career is at my height, this fight continues. It has so many of the same attitudes, so many of the same negativities coming towards us that it's, it's always been a huge driver to me personally of why I want to do advocacy work at all is RJ, is reproductive justice, is abortion access. Okay. There we go. All right. So I'm, I'm going to be real. So 
why vote? Why, why do we even vote? Because obviously we're in the South. It's very hit or miss on if we're going to get folks. And then we get people who oftentimes we feel don't actually represent us. I know um, my husband often, who is not in the movement work, talks about like it feels lesser of two evils. So why vote? So I'm, you know, voting is one tool in a large tool chest. It is not the end all be all. I'm going to say that as someone who literally has the word vote tattooed on my arm, still saying it's one tool in a tool chest. Like we have to be honest about that. We cannot tell ourselves and we cannot tell our communities that our problems end at voting, that voting will solve everything. It is a tool. It is a tool in everything else that you're learning about today that you've learned about in your work and that you're putting forward. So I'm going to set that tone right now. I am not one of those people who's just like, you got to turn out and vote. That's a thing that we all do. It's one of the other things I, I really want to be clear about with voting is it is not about having someone save us. I don't care who you are picturing right now. That person is not going to save us. We are going to save us. We are going to save ourselves. And voting is a step in doing that. Um, so I'm going to cover the super, super basics. And again, we're going to go back into question time. I just, you know, don't have a good gauge of where everyone is on this. So feel free to come back around to this. There's kind of three major ways to vote in Georgia. We're going to go over just very basic hows. Vote by mail, which also called absentee ballot. Um, early vote which the state will call absentee in person. And then obviously election day vote. Election day vote is kind of the tightest. You have to go between seven to seven. You have to go to a very specific precinct that you are assigned to, generally gonna be pretty close to your house. Early vote is, um, it's interesting because you can't go to any precinct in your county. And so that leaves people more open. There is uh, about two weeks of early voting and required to be at least one Saturday. Some bigger counties will also have a second Saturday and or a Sunday on top. And so that's the same experience of going to a polling place, you know, filling out the information and going to a machine and getting your sticker. But it's just during that two weeks before an election. And then vote by mail or absentee vote, um, is where so much heat has been coming recently. And I'll talk about this in a minute. It's just kind of the voter suppression in the country and in the South and in Georgia. But vote by mail became extremely popular in 2020 when people were watching out for COVID, were being careful and taking care of themselves. Prior to that, it had been heavily like older folks, and especially older white folks is just what the information shows. And so that tended just by the demographics to trend Republican. And so it was a well-supported effort to keep vote by mail active until 2020. <laughs> I don't know if y'all can hear it, but he was doing something upstairs. Um, until 2020, when record numbers of folks, young folks, black folks, brown folks, queer folks were using vote by mail as a safe way to have their voice heard during the pandemic. And so in 2021, we saw all kinds of new limitations put on vote by mail, which includes things like it's, um, they lessened both the time that you have to apply and the time that you have to turn it. They cut off a week of time that you can ask for an absentee ballot there at the end. So there's a whole week between early vote time and like actual election day where you can't order a ballot anymore. You also previous to the to last year could order your absentee ballot online. You just fill out a thing, send in the request, and it would come back to you in the mail. But now you have to have what's called a wet signature, which means you have to be able to print it and mail it in. Big limitation for a lot of people where we don't have broadband across the state of Georgia. So to be able to like go online, print it, write it, pay the stamp to send it in is a big limitation. I have had interns now that I am over 30. I have had interns who legit don't know how to send a letter. And that, like, that's cool. Not no judgment. Like there's technology has advanced beyond you needing to know that. But if you wanted to 
vote by mail, like you'd have to know how to do that to even order it. Um, and that was not the case before this kind of resurgence of the popularity of vote by mail. So that, like I said, is part of a history of voter suppression. And it's also intentional. It doesn't just happen. It's not like a background. Um, so I'm just going to kind of put this vibe check in here. Um, stop sharing my screen for a quick second. If people can put in the chat, um, just an idea of where are you in, in your understanding of kind of the history of voter suppression? Um, I mean, obviously we get things like grandfather clauses. We have things like all white primaries, poll taxes. We have kind of like thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm seeing some yup. People feeling good? Okay. So let me go on back. Awesome. Thank y'all. So great. I don't want to spend a whole ton of time talking about things that y'all feel comfortable with talking with. So let's focus a little bit more on recent years. So in recent years, it's really focused on, on things that you could see as more administrative, right? Like prior to this, the idea was, oh, we are, you know, being very blatant. We are trying to keep people from voting, but now it takes forms that seem almost more, like I said, administrative. And complicated rules for absentee voting, like I just talked about, are a huge part of it. Voter ID. Georgia was the first state to pass voter ID, and that only popped up in 2000. And well, it started in 2004 and then kind of kicked up everywhere else. That's not something that's been around for forever. Uh, the limiting of early voting hours. I saw someone in the chat put in moving voting polling locations. Huge problem, especially when they do it right before the election. We'll have places that close 10 days before the election and no mail goes out about them. No notices or go out. And people have very limited time windows to go vote. Y'all know this as working folks. Like it's difficult to arrange your life to go vote. You have people make plans. And we, we mean that literally, you make a plan to go vote because you got to fit it into your life. So making these administrative changes is very intentional to make it slightly more difficult. The, the way that I explain it to folks is in the entire state of Georgia, our most recent elections, like our big scale elections between the governor in 2018, president in 2020, were decided by 14,000 and 11,000 votes. So you don't have to suppress massive amounts of votes to make a change in the outcome of an election. You get 20 people here, 100 people here, 30 people here, and it adds up and it makes a difference. And that can change the outcome of an election. And then recently, all across the country, we see really big scale efforts for things like disinformation. Disinformation is different from misinformation. Misinformation is when someone's just wrong. Disinformation is intentional, in case anyone didn't know those differences. Um, but we also have new methods put forward that allow local counties, local officials, and then the state election boards to literally refuse to certify votes. Both specific votes, they can say like, oh, this bubble's not really filled in that way, it's not correct, or certify votes from like the entire county. Um, a lot of this was going on in New Mexico recently where they were refusing to certify votes. It's a real concern for this year that they can say, oh, I think there's something fishy going on here. I'm not gonna certify these results. Um, this whole, again, back to the disinformation of 2020 is what's bringing that forward. So again, I'm gonna kind of pop out of my window here so I can't really see the two things at once. Um, yeah, I think the language too is an, is a critical point here, right? Like voter protection. Um, if you'll see, you'll see on the stickers that you get now, they even say like, I secured my vote, like secure the vote is big change, um, to kind of how you they talk about elections. 
because it's almost exactly the same kind of language you use about like pro-life. Like, oh, I love life. Life is cool. Who wouldn't be pro-life? But that's not what they mean, right? We all know that. And we all know that voter protection, election security, that's not the intended way that it's to be taken either. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm also kind of seeing in the chat, uh, Sierra mentions she got a, pre a letter changing about her precinct changing after election day. Sounds right. Sounds right. We were seeing a lot of this in 2020, especially because places were closing for COVID. Uh, like schools, churches were saying, now we can't be a polling place right now. That's too unsafe for um for the folks that use this location in you know in general. And then because of the slowdowns in the mail, the counties weren't able to get that information out to people quickly, even the ones who were intentionally trying, which is not all of them, I'll be honest. Um, and so we are seeing again, it's it's truly the administrative processes. I'll tell you one more little kind of small story before we move on is I for a long time did voter registration as well as education. And one day I go to the Secretary of State's office to drop off some app some applications and I see um, this stack of cards in the back. And hopefully all y'all are registered and you remember getting your little, you know, precinct card that tells you, hey, you're Stephanie, you vote here, etc. And this stack was up to probably my hip and I'm not huge, but like, that's a good like, two foot stack. Those are all cards that had not been mailed out to people. That's thousands of cards that had not been mailed out to people to confirm, hey, yes, you are registered to vote. And also, hey, FYI, here is where you go vote. Things like that, which can just be seen as administrative, like, oh, we haven't had time to get those out. Oh, oh, we're waiting until we have a bulk rate to send out. When it's really and truly intentional, they mean to keep those because if I don't send Amy and Jenny their cards and they don't know that they're registered, how do they know to go vote? And it's 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 very intentional. Um, Jenny brings up a great point in the chat, too, about the percentage of voters whose absentee ballots were thrown out. This is, again, another important change from these administrative things that happen. Here in Georgia, we saw that increase, too, to around like 21 percent in some places where because of the changes like wet signature, because of the changes like there's new oaths that have to be in certain locations and your driver's license number now has to go on it. Those are all different from it was in 2020. And so people who used um, absentee voting in 2021, which was a much smaller number because that was just municipal elections, um, I'm talking fall 21, were rejected at intensely higher rates because of all the new changes. And all, again, administrative. It is, um, I like using the word insidious because it's technically what the word insidious means, is that it's just very intentionally under the radar, like hard to pin down because as you try to fight it, as you try to push back, it's always, there's always an argument for it. There's always an argument. So um, I do then want to take a second as we are going back to, um, you know, kind of why this all matters. Yeah, I know there's a way for me to not have to go back to the beginning every time. Please excuse me. I do want to talk a little bit about who holds the power. So one of the things, um, New Georgia Project has a big research department, which I love. They get to do really cool things like actually do direct um, studies with folks, do, um, oh my gosh, I can never remember what these are called. Anyhow, like user surveys where they're literally sitting down with people, asking them questions and getting their input on how things matter. And one of the biggest things that we have found through these studies is that people would vote more often or would vote more, you know, down the ballot if they had any idea what these positions are. That's why voter education is so important. We can't tell people like, oh, go vote without telling them, like, why does that matter? Like, why do I care about labor commissioner? Right. Why do I care about public service commission? Like, what does that even mean? And so one of the things we are starting to work on is framing 
these races in the tune of kind of the projects we work on. NGP works on multiple issues, including RJ. And so we started with RJ. Oh, girl, I don't know what that was about. Okay, sorry. Um, that man's face should not be on there. Excuse me. Try that again. All right. So all of these positions have a way that they affect reproductive justice. So we're talking about these positions across the um, ballot, up and down the ballot. They do directly affect reproductive justice. And people just don't know that. They don't think about that. So we have a guide that we're kind of breaking this out. And we are doing these in some other efforts. Like we just um, finished one on labor that we're about to release. And we'll be doing on a few more things. But I'm going to break these down and we can talk about these a little bit more. But why should someone who cares about reproductive justice vote in the governor's election? And and I'll be, I'll, I'm going to restate this. I'm hoping you've probably heard it quite a few times. This is a C3 space, so I'm not going to talk about specific candidates. Um, I do also work for New Georgia Project um, Action Fund, which is our C4. And the C4 has an affiliated PAC, so I get to do some actual candidate-based work. So um, I'm trying very hard to keep myself in line. Um, just, just, keep, just keep me honest here, y'all. So anyhow, the governor, why should someone vote in the governor's race? As a governor, obviously, I think most clearly that people understand can veto legislation that comes to their desk, like period, the end. If we ended up with a split leadership, Let's say if if Stacey Abrams were elected and then the House and Senate were both Republican, that would still allow that governor to veto anything else. Same thing if, if Brian Kemp is reelected and it's a Democratic House and Senate. He could still veto any legislation that he did not like. So that is like an ultimate power of the governor. And then, of course, like there's a way to overcome that veto, but it has to be a two third majority, which neither party has the strength to do a two third majority at this point. Uh, they can also sign, sign executive orders that protect access to abortion, including things like telemedicine abortion. This is a little bit harder in the states. They can try to do it, um, but it's more so like on the federal level, the executive position does have that option. We saw President Biden come out with an executive order on abortion was it six weeks ago, five weeks ago, which included like protections for crossing state lines. So the governor has a more limited capacity to do that here in the state, but it, it include it can include things like uh, medication access and telemedicine. They also one of the biggest powers the governor has is appointment. Um. And our current governor, Governor Kemp, has been very shrewd about the way that he uses that appointment process, especially with judges. And so a governor has an option to appoint officials, including judges, that are supportive of things like reproductive health and abortion access. The reason that's critically important for things like judges is judges are often going to be the ones to decide punishment in cases. So if there is a person being prosecuted under any of the new rules of 481 or any other anti-choice legislation, a judge can kind of set some of those within the bounds that they're allowed limitations for, for their punishment. Or it can just choose, you know, prosecutors and things like that can choose not to pro, um, proceed with prosecution. So judges are critically important when we're talking about anything criminal justice related and abortion access now is especially related to criminal justice because we have to worry about things like prosecution. And then the governor can influence the state house and senate the state house and the senate leadership uh, for their legislative agenda. Obviously that only kind of really works in their own party. So again if we ended up either way with a split party between the governor and the um, legislature. There's some limitations to that, but the governor can influence, at least in their party, um, how that legislative process works. So obviously I think a lot of people from our understanding kind of have, an under have, a, have a goal of voting in the governor's election. If they're gonna vote, it's because they know this top ticket, the Senate and the governor. 
that's what they know. But what about the pieces below that? So one of the, the next kind of thing on the ticket is Lieutenant Governor. And people have no clue what that is. 100% guarantee you, like, uh, maybe outside of a space like this, most people you talk to won't know what that role is really about. The important piece about Lieutenant Governor is that they are the head of the Senate. And so they can keep legislation that opposes abortion from moving forward at all in a lot of creative ways. And this does not necessarily matter if their party is in the in the um, majority or not. So, for example, if you have a lieutenant governor who wants to see something get buried, they can put it in a committee where they know it's not going to move, where like they have friendly people, where the um, their own party is leading. They could. Um, so perfect example is our current lieutenant governor, Jeff Duncan, who is a Republican. He's not running again, um, didn't support the Buckhead initiative to like separate out of Atlanta. And so when the bill came, he put it in a committee that was made up just to be like all Democrats who were going to vote against it. He put it in that committee to die. It didn't get hearing like to for um, a vote. It never moved. And so <laughs> that was how he, he didn't have to vote against it. He didn't have to bring his party up against it. He could always say the Dems killed it, but he put it there intentionally to bury it. And that's a power a lieutenant governor has. Same thing of if it something does make it out of committee, the lieutenant governor can choose what to call up for the day. Um, there Now, there are some procedural plays that smart senators can do to try to get them pulled up. Again, we saw kind of a battle with um, Jeff Duncan doing something similar for, what was the issue? It was one of the education bills this year where he was just not going to call it up. He was just going to skip it on the list of bills. And so that's another thing that they can do, just never call the bill. And then um, again, assign senators. So the lieutenant governor gets to assign who's on what committee. And that's a hugely important thing. So if they know there's going to be some anti-abortion, anti-choice bills coming, and that's going to go through like House and Humans or Human Services Committee, I'm going to put all of my pro-choice senators on that committee so that it's dead. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a flip side way of doing bury the legislation. If they don't want to be blamed that way, they just be like, oh, I tried to let it play out its own way and it still died. So um, they don't get a, a lot of credit for, I think, doing that. Um, you know, Jeff Duncan is, um, again, not running. He's our current lieutenant governor, but he had some conflicts with his current party that I think brought some of these skills to light. Um, notably, he did not do that with 481. Instead, he just walked off the floor and decided not to be a part of the debate. So that was... Um, a choice. If Rula's here, I can't see if you're here, Rula, but I'm trying. I'm trying real hard for you. Um, Attorney General. Sorry, did you want me to say something? No, nope, I'm just trying real hard to keep it C3 for you, Rula. You're doing great. You're doing great. Um, if, if I could just like help a people Please. understand why this matters. So Amplify Georgia Collaborative is a 501c3 organization, which under IRS regulations means we have to be nonpartisan. That does not mean we don't do issue advocacy, and it does not mean we don't call out elected officials who are doing the wrong thing or thank elected officials who are doing the right thing. And even in election time, we can say things about candidates, but it has to be strictly like this person said something that we reject, right? Uh, we are not tying it because we're nonpartisan. We're not tying it to you need to vote for this person or when you make your vote, be sure that you think about this candidate. That's not how we do we're still very much in the game of making sure people know what's on the ballot, who's on the ballot, that they can vote, and what these different positions are responsible for on the issues that we care about. Um, so that's the vein that NGP is showing up in today. However, New Georgia Project has New Georgia Project the C3 and New Georgia Project the C4, and their 501c4 side of their organization can do more active partisan activities like telling people uh, we think this candidate is the best choice for this issue. Or um, C4s can also endorse candidates. 
Um, so I will leave it there. I'll step in if there's something that you're saying that is crossing our line for this space, but you're good. Yeah, of course. I'm always happy to. Okay, let me get back to sharing this. And I do see um, the point about the districts, and I'm absolutely coming to that because that is a huge piece of this voter suppression this year. So, all right, again, um, back to our positions. So Attorney General is what I would say is probably the most important position for RJ right now. And that is because Attorney General is the kind of, you know, the, the simple way to say it is the lawyer for the state. But they also have that that means that they have kind of the authority to determine how we enforce laws and what the meaning of laws are, the definitions of them. And so um, Chris Carr is our current attorney general. He is running again. You can see the two other people running um, there in the picture. And so if it, when 481 was passed and people were, are suing against it, saying, you know, it's a violation, it goes against Roe versus Wade, all of these issues. Chris Carr made the choice on behalf of the state to, to stand with the bill. And, you know, he's the one who back, picks the reasonings behind that and how to enforce that. Same thing for all the kind of voter suppression bills. It's him and his office that have to defend it. And so, um, opponents may choose to go about that differently. And so um, they can choose to not enforce. They can choose to define things differently and say, oh, this part of the bill actually means X. Um, and that, again, can go for kind of any bill that passes through. And so additionally to that, they can kind of advise prosecutors and attorneys on their recommendations for, for prosecuting and importantly, not prosecuting cases that relate to abortion laws, voter laws, what, what have you. So attorney general right now is a critically important position. So for example, the day that Dobbs decision came down, that afternoon, Chris Carr, our attorney general, put forward a request to the um, judge here in Georgia to lift the injunction on 481, which basically means hey, now that the Supreme Court has said Roe is gone, you should make our law also good because that's what was holding it up. Another attorney general could have just chosen not to do that and keep that battle going in court longer because there was no reason to request the injunction if you didn't want to. Obviously, he decided that he wanted to and he, that the state wanted to. And so that's the power the attorney general has. Um, obviously there's a lot of complicated pieces, like he's not going to be able to do it completely on his own. The party, the donors, everything is going to have an impact, but, you know, technically by the rules, he can make that decided decision. Um, they can also challenge in court the standing of the law. And so if, if someone really truly wanted to, an attorney general could go back and challenge standing Georgia law and be like, we don't think this should stand anymore. We think this should come down. This happens every once in a while in states for things that are like very old laws that are still on the books for kind of pre-civil rights era laws. And so it can happen. And there are um, opponents of his that have said that they would do similar things. So they have the choice to not only not enforce, but to actively challenge the law as it stood. So um, this is a race that I think for RJ advocates and people who are really interested in seeing change happen at a statewide level in Georgia, attorney general is a hugely important, um, important level to focus on right now. I'll say that. Um, and then finally, is there is state representative, state senator. This one I hope is a little more cut and dry, but they can't, they're the ones who write the legislation, which can either protect access to abortion or to any other kind of reproductive justice issue, including telemedicine, getting getting your pills in the mail, um, 
<laughs> they can also write bad legislation, which like funds crisis pregnancy centers or whatever else comes through their minds. Uh, now, obviously, no shocker, a lot of these things come from lobbyists. A lot of these things come from conservative groups, uh, things like Georgia Right to Life, who is behind um, the telemedicine bill from earlier this year. And so they, they are where that begins. And they can also work to repeal those laws by making laws in the, in the opposite um, or in the affirmative if it's a negative bill. So they can, they have that beginner part, part of it that's so important of saying, this is what the law will say now. And it could go into court and the judges deal with it like has been going on with 481. But this is where it starts. So I do want to, um, I'm going to take a second to stop sharing to just kind of talk because someone brought up in the chat, and I'm so sorry, Hannah, I'm going to see your name in just a second, um, about the fact that people don't know who their folks are anymore. And I think that is a great point. So, um, oh man, so this is a whole battle and I'm just kind of taking a breath because um, this was how I spent my whole fall, but we went through redistricting this year. Briefest version I can give y'all is we, we redistrict every 10 years after census. And so redistricting is draw, redrawing the lines. The party in power gets to do that in Georgia. Complete, and it's the Supreme Court has said you can do that based on um, past voting history. You just can't draw lines that discriminate based on race. Now, race and past voting history tend to go hand in hand very heavily. But as long as you can prove it was not based on race, everything else is fine. And so um, we have always ended up in Georgia and in most places in the South with very heavy, very heavily um, gerrymandered districts. Gerrymander is a term that just basically means a funny looking district that's drawn to support one side or the other. So I'm going to show you one tool that New Georgia Project has that will help with this. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen, but we have a tool called readyset.vote. And all right. So readyset.vote is really fun in that ooh, you can, oh, sorry, y'all. I've been playing. You know, I have to forget my ballot. It will pull up your ballot, tell you who your representatives are, and then it'll show you like who's going to be on your ballot this year so that you can do your own research on these folks and decide who you want to vote for. And I, again, I know a lot of people here are kind of already well informed. You may already know this. Um, you'll all see my address. Send me postcards if you want to. And then I put in next. You can just skip it or put in it. If you want to save your ballot, put in you know your info. It's going to pop up all of this information of you know when do you register, when's early voting, when can you request it, and it's going to tell you your districts. And then you see my ballot. And bam, it gives you all the candidates for all of the positions that are on the ballot. So, for example, we have attorney general here and it has the three folks. You can go down and read their profile. So let's I mean, I don't even know much about this gentleman, Martin, but you can see voting and representation. You can see direct quotes from him and go straight to his website. It's a super easy way to do some research on some candidates. Also, you can build your own ballot. So if you were like, oh, Martin's my jam, you would pick choose and it would save it for his, I mean, for your ballot. And at the end, it would give you a little ballot that says, here's all the people that you chose. You can also do it kind of by issue. If you were like, oh, criminal justice, let's read through which pieces that they talk about. Um, so this is updated. <laughs> Believe me, honey, we did a ton of work to make sure that these are correct districts for folks. Um, we did have plenty of time to kind of play with it in the primaries. And so we've made sure that we've gotten through some of the issues. So this is something that you can share with folks that you can encourage people to use because it allows that um, independent research that is so hard to do for these positions because 
you'd have to know the name of them and you'd have to, um, you know, search them all independently and come back with it and know where to find the sources. And so um, I've been really excited about it. And it's a super easy thing to remember, just ready, set, dot, vote. And um, like I said, we work very, my team and I work very closely with the developers here to make sure that everything is accurate. And if someone flags an inaccuracy to me, we don't just fix it. We like get into the weeds of why did that come up that way so that we can fix it system wide. So um, I hope you all use it and I hope you pass it on to people because, yeah, it's going to be super confusing for folks to know because, um, again, I'm imagining um, I run our election protection work, which I'll talk about in just a quick second, but I'm imagining early votes going to be okay and smooth. But once it gets to election day, everyone has to go to their precinct and it's a new precinct. You don't know, you may not know where it is in a new district. It's going to be messy. It's going to be messy. So this will help. Um, it's my goal. That's my goal. All right. So my last kind of thing is how can, how can you help? How can you help make this easier? So one is use ready, set, dot, vote. Tell everyone about it. Please share it. We would love for people to use it. I will flag that you're not allowed to bring, it does work on mobile really well, but you're not allowed to bring your phone into polling places and like, you know, look at it. So you might want to print it out, that sort of thing. Um, the second thing you can do is, and I know Rula will have some sign up sheets where people can kind of um, put your name down if you'd like to join us. On election day, my team and I cover, during the primaries, we covered 450 sites across the state. Our goal for general is to cover 950 sites, but we are there in person to make sure that no voter oppression is going on. Well, as much as we can prevent, I'll say that, let me say that. But we are there to monitor to make sure that sites are open and working and the machines are working and that there's no voter intimidation like police standing outside or big MAGA hat folks yelling at anyone. Um, we are there making sure that if people are at the wrong location and they're turned away, we help them look it up and get to the right location. Um, and so if you would like to help, we call that our VOPRO voter protection. We could use volunteers because obviously getting 950 sites covered across the state, we're going to be in 40 counties is our goal. Um, is going to take a lot, a lot of effort. So please, please, please sign up. Rula just um, kind of dropped a, a link you can use to sign up. The other thing you can do is, if you're already committed on election day is we also have a project we call the Dirty South Democracy Agenda. I love it. I'm going to pause for you to just love it as well. But um, our reproductive justice work is part of that larger Dirty South Democracy Agenda. And it's just, that's the way we speak to our, our communities and the ways we organize. And so the way you can support that work, again, by signing up um, with Rula is, one is tell your story. If you have a story, tell it to, to be willing to tell it because y'all know how these people folks are. They don't believe things are happening until they have a face and they don't have a name with it. Um, and then uh, on addition to that, you can join us for kind of targeted um, targeted outreach to people that we know are supporters of reproductive justice. So we do phone calls, we do door knocking, we do letter writing, all GOTV, like get out the vote for folks that we know support reproductive justice, and we want them to turn out to vote for those reasons. And so um, help us with some targeted outreach, help us get folks to the polls, and um, we'd love to have you. We're going to have some pledges people can sign coming soon, but, you know, who doesn't want to be a part of the Dirty South democracy agenda? Like, it's so much fun just to be, just to say it. Um, before you even ask, I have asked so many times when t-shirts are coming. So as soon as they do, I'm sure you'll hear about them. Um, I want to use our last like 10 minutes or so for questions or affirmation statements, requests, whatever folks got. And, and as folks are coming on stage um, or getting Grace's help, uh, lifting up that Sharon mentioned, there are other people who do kind of similar election protection work, like uh, the DPG, the um, RNC, the Republican Party of Georgia is doing it this year. Um, 
Are our sisters of the people's agenda do it? So there's there's options. Obviously, I prefer you do it with me, but you know, not picky. Just go help. My partner in crime, do we have any like questions or statements? Thank you. I'm coming back on screen. Great. Um, I see one question in the chat uh, that has not been answered. Oh, it's how can we support you all digitally? So Jenny is asking because although she's not based in Georgia, the work that she does is digital support for organizers and organizations. Um, yeah, absolutely. You want to talk about that? Yeah, I would love it. So I will um, share screen too because I do have this whole page that's like our, you know, what are they called? Um, here we go. Hold on just a second. This is the one I want. Um, where you can find us. So like I said, we have our C3 and our C4. So follow us on both New Georgia Project and New Georgia Project Action Fund. So we're going to have some really great educational resources, like I said there, that you can share, that you can promote. Not only do we have um, readyset.vote and we have the guide, like I just mentioned, but we are about to have come out with something I'm really excited about, which is called What Even Is. It is a video, like a digital video project that takes two minutes to sit down and just say, what even is this position? Again, kind of going back to that idea that people aren't gonna vote for something if they don't know what it is. And so it just stops and says, what even is agriculture commissioner? Like, what do they do? And what even is insurance commissioner? And not just in the technical sense of like that you could read off of Wikipedia, but like how does an agriculture commissioner affect you? I did not know until actually this year that agriculture commissioners oversee shelters, like dog shelters, animal shelters. And I love me a shelter dog. So I was excited. Those types of things, but very targeted. And so that's um, one of the big things to help us share. But also we can definitely do... Um, we have peer-to-peer -peer texting that we need help with. So text bank with us, which can be done digitally. I think we can do our phone banks digitally. And so um, we'd love any of that support to, um, to to get us over this over this goal, to get all of our folks turned out. Okay. Thank you so much, Steph. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. You were saying? Yes, I see a question from Sydney. What Go is the best it. way to vote to make sure your vote is counted? Is it possible to have early vote, absentee in person be thrown out? Okay, so this is a great question. I, my stance as someone who's been doing voter work for over a decade is to never tell anyone how to vote in the sense of like, if, if it works for you, that's how you should vote. However, I will share that the way I vote and the way that I prefer to tell people is like, my preferred method is to vote early in person when you can, whenever you can. That way, if there is any complication, you have time to address it. If you went to vote early on like, okay, I'm not even going to try to do dates. Y'all, I'm going to mess them up. I can't, I can't do that. I'm bad at math. But if you were going on a Tuesday before the election and they were like, no, nah, you're not registered and you know you are, you, you know it you still got multiple days to address that problem versus like if you were going on election day, you you only had a couple of hours and you may have to go back to work. Um, I like voting early just because it gives you this chance to make sure that, that you've had that opportunity. Um, I have no problem with vote by mail other than the fact that just there's so many things that can go wrong and you have to be just like very vigilant to track it online and make sure that they didn't flag it. And then you have to do all the work to track it back down. Um, so absentee in person doesn't really have that problem of being thrown out because it's the same as voting on election day. You're going to vote on the machine. It's going to print out and it's going to read through. So you don't have to worry about it having someone be like, oh, this vote doesn't count because X. That is really only when people are like physically filling in the bubble and they want to say, oh, it doesn't. It's not filled in all the way, whatever. Um, okay, so JJ is, um, Lopez asks, I know you have the Atlanta area covered, but what about the outreach for rural Georgia? 
Yes. Yes. Love it. So like I said, we have 40 counties that we want to cover and that's yes, Metro, um, but also all across the state. Uh, New Georgia Project has offices in 17 counties. And so that is everywhere from like Atlanta over to Augusta and down to Valdosta over to Troop County. And so we are where our community is. And so, um, yes, we could always use more help anywhere that folks are. We will be there. We have our folks going out every single day to places like McIntosh and Burke and Randolph County because that's where our communities are. And that's where the communities who need to hear from us are. Um, and so we can, we can certainly, certainly, certainly use more help anywhere that we can get it and would love it in rural Georgia if folks um, who are here are from any of these areas or know folks in those areas, hit us up. Like I said, we are in, my, my goal is on election day to have 40 counties covered. And I think our overall organizing efforts are really focusing um, in those same kind of counties up to election day. So we could use it any time. Okay, um, I'm scanning one more time for questions. I um, I see one last one. I've been scrolling through Ready, Set, Vote and seeing some races that don't mention Choice or RJ. Since this is my number one issue this election, I would love this information to be included. Do you go strictly by what's on their website or do you look at their voting history? It sounds like that's a question plus a suggestion. Yes, it's a, it's a yes and, which I love a yes and. I love it. Um, yes, so... It kind of goes by what the biggest polling issues are. I think that's one of the biggest pieces that I'm in talked with them about adding is I at least want it to the bigger, um, to make sure all the bigger pieces have it. And then some of them, um, it won't be on there just because they don't have any issue information to base it off of. Um, I, I've been going through that experience. We've been working on trying to make an RJ like vote scorecard and it's difficult because if someone hasn't been around to vote on an issue, then we don't have their vote history. And then a lot of them won't have it on their website. And so it it's kind of iffy. We want to have like really legitimate information. And, so, and we also just really don't want it to be like, did not answer for everything. Um, but that is a, a, is a really good point that I have been bringing up with them that we're hoping to get integrated in the next like few weeks at least for like, like I said, some of those bigger statewide positions that I think it's critically important for folks to know how they stand. Yeah. Okay. Um, that is going to wrap up our questions. Um, and I just want to say one more thing on that note is that if you are, if you've looked at your voter guide and you're finding that it doesn't say everything you want it to say, or it's overlooked an issue that you want, um, there's two things you can do. One is do your research directly individually by going to votesmart.org. Um, another option, and this is a piece of organizing that is available to us and is something that we've been talking about uh, for this election cycle, is uh, ask your candidates directly. Because if they hear from you directly, uh, they're going to know that there are voters in their district who care about it. And that will push candidates to have to say something. Um, especially if you don't have a voting record on them that you can look up, that's a way to start to hear both, you know, what they're willing to say and, and their opinions and beliefs, but also you can get commitments from them. Um, you can hold them accountable. Uh, and we can ask them to talk about their positions and what they plan to do without that crossing a line into being um, an, a partisan activity. Uh, what I as Amplify can't do is say, like, do you promise that if you're elected, you will support X, Y, and Z? Um, but I can definitely say, what's your stance on this? What do you want voters to know about what you plan to do in office? Um, so stay tuned if you want to make sure that we are um, getting in touch with our candidates uh, as well as our elected officials, because I do believe anybody asking for your vote should be able to tell you whether and how they support reproductive rights and abortion access, as well as the broader reproductive justice agenda. That's your right and always ask. Um, so let's see, I am gonna make sure that the tools are in here for you in the chat before we go. Um, Grace, could you please put the um, sign up link for folks? 
um, as a call to action, that would be the green button that goes under Steph's face. Uh, sometimes it pops up and it makes it a little easier. There it is. Yeah, sign up here. So, and if you need it in spelled out form, it's tinyurl. Let me just grab it. tinyurl.com slash RJ elections. Yeah, there it is. Um, and then uh, I saw people asking uh, what else they could do to share and spread information about what all these different positions do. So NGP has created amazing resources and materials on this. One is called the Repro Voter Guide, I'm putting that in the chat. And the other one is more extensive. So the Repro Voter Guide is one page that says, what do these positions have to do with reproductive health and rights? Because so many people don't know. Um, the other one is Repro Voter Kit. It's a Repro Voter Toolkit, and it really talks about the whole RJ um, framework and ways to look out for, you know, if they haven't said where they stand on abortion, sometimes you end up knowing that they don't stand for other parts of reproductive justice. Uh, and that's important too. Uh, and a, a framework wide support is what we're really looking for. So if they're saying anti LGBTQ things, if they are, um, if they're using code words like being tough on crime, which really means locking more black and brown people up usually, um, those are the kinds of things you can look for as well. So look in that voter toolkit as well as the one page voter guide. And uh, if you find things that are missing, let us know. Uh, I'm gonna hop over to my next session. And just as um, an FYI to everybody, uh, these are concurrent sessions. So you have choices of three breakouts in the next hour. And the way that you find it, you go to that top left schedule where it says schedule, scroll down and you'll see, um, where are we at? Um, skill building part one. Um, so skill building part one, you have three options, protecting self and others from criminalization, storytelling and personal narrative for public leadership and how to talk about abortion with your people. Uh, looking forward to seeing you there. We'll hop over and programs will get started at 105. Thank you so, so much to Stephanie and to New Georgia Project for finding time to talk about all of this with us. Happy to. Y'all are great. You are also great. Bye. Bye, y'all.